friends, comrades. <laughs> First of all, can I say what a pleasure it is to be in a room full of conservatives for a change. Real, real people of conservative values. Um, I want to begin, and this is a true pleasure, in congratulating Simon, Rory, and the whole team at the Freedom Association on putting together this conference. It's an incredible effort, and you've done a superb job in bringing us all together. So congratulations for that. Europe is the issue that got me involved in politics as a teenager, through the campaign for an independent Britain. Um, the first issue that actually got me into politics back in 1983 was the introduction of compulsory seatbelts in cars. I was completely opposed to this outrageous um, intrusion on my liberties. So I'm a libertarian first and a Eurosceptic uh, second. I'm also one of those people, unlike Ken Clark, who was sad enough to read the Maastricht Treaty. I kind of figured that it was important to understand what it was that John Major had signed us up to when he told us that it was game, set and match for the British people, when of course it was nothing of the kind. And I remember when I was studying law just down the road at Southampton, that I was astonished doing my EU law course to find out that a whole series of European court decisions uh, had occurred long before the Maastricht Treaty, indeed long before we even joined the then common market. And it became abundantly clear to me as, a, uh, as an 18 year old student, not to put too fine a point on it, that we had been lied to. Yes. British people yeah, yeah. were lied to in the 1970s as the effect of British membership of the common market, and we've been lied to uh, ever since. So why is it um, that I, at least, take the view that we should all be Eurosceptics uh, rather than um, Federalists or Federasts, as uh, some might call them? <laughs> the first reason I think that we need to uh, remember and to bang on about, in David Cameron's phrase, as uh, all of us are Eurosceptics here, was highlighted by Tony Benn. Tony Benn spoke at a meeting uh, that I hosted 15 years ago. He was more than happy to come to conservative events and uh, I was chairing the conservative graduates at the time at a meeting at which he very favorably compared Margaret Thatcher to Bodicea. <laughs> Tony Benn said this, if you meet a powerful person ask them five questions. You'll have seen this I think today in the uh, obituaries of Tony Benn. What power have you got? Where did you get it from? In whose interest do you exercise it? To whom are you accountable? and how can we get rid of you? <laughs> if you can't get rid of the people who govern you, said Tony Benn, you do not live in a democratic system. <laughs> when we're governed under a system where 84% of our laws are made in Brussels, mostly by qualified majority voting, by those we cannot remove, we do not live in a democracy. We are outvoted, and a foreign corpus of law, an alien tradition of civil, not common law, is being imposed yes. on us from Brussels. Three. The second reason, corruption. Now, I appreciate you're all enjoying a drink. We've got dinner soon. This bit could go on for hours. <laughs> um, the European Union, as we know, is corrupt. The European Court of Auditors hasn't signed off on the EU's accounts for years. Europe costs us billions more than George Osborne has slashed in public spending. Yes. And of course we have the absurd system of multiple European parliaments and a gravy train. Yep. I just say it's rather intimidating having Lady Thatcher standing by me <laughs> as I'm speaking as my conscience almost literally on my shoulder. <laughs> the third reason I think that we should focus on our Euroscepticism is the morality, or rather the immorality, of the European Union. And we shouldn't shy away from this as Conservatives. And I apologise to those of you in the room who have left the Conservative Party um, uh, for the UK Independence Party. I'm using a small C Conservative uh, for these purposes. The common agricultural policy costs the average family in this country £1,200 a year. That is a prohibitive, offensive and immoral cost to the poorest families in this country that we should be standing up for. 
It also imposes outrageous trade restrictions on the poorest people in the world, particularly in Africa. The common agricultural policy, in my view, is responsible for the deaths of more people in Africa than any colonialist or African despot ever has been. The fourth reason that we should campaign against the European Union is simply that it's anti-British. Quoting Tony Benn again, quotes, and this was in the 1970s, he said this, if democracy is destroyed in Britain, it will not be the communists, Trotskyists or subversives, but this House of Commons, he said, which threw it away. The rights that are entrusted to us are not for us to give away. Even if I agree with everything that's proposed, I cannot hand away the powers lent to me for five years by my constituents. I just could not do it, said Tony Benn. It would be a theft of public rights. And he was right about that. The fifth reason. Hopefully Conservatives and UKIPers can agree on this one. The European Union is institutionally leftist. Why else did Jacques Delors go out of his way to woo the Labour movement? We have a regulatory burden imposed on people that costs hundreds of billions of pounds and the Single European Act, the one reason that we keep being told we should stay in, cannot deliver free trade, proper free trade within the European Union, let alone globally. Let us never forget the words of Margaret Thatcher when she said we've not successfully rolled back the frontiers of the state in Britain only to see them reimposed at a European level with a European superstate exercising a new dominance from Brussels. Sixth reason. We have to face the facts here. There is a relentless drive towards a federal Europe. The acquis communautaire means there will be no rolling back of past gains from the Federalists. We're deluding ourselves if we truly think that we can renegotiate more favourable terms of our membership that will see an eroding of the acquis communautaire. Take these people at their word. They want an ever closer union of the peoples of Europe. That is their goal. That is not our goal. I do not doubt their sincerity or the beauty of that piano tune. <laughs> I do not doubt the sincerity of the Federalists in Europe. They wanted to avoid another world war. But the European Union is a 1970s solution to a 1950s problem. It is out of date and not in our interests as a nation. Seventhly, it is limiting our horizons. Rory mentioned that Britain is a global nation. Our language, our legal system, our commercial traditions, our Commonwealth ties mean that Britain wants to be a player on the global stage. I do not want to be a little European, and I don't know about you, I get sick and tired of being called a little Englander for having these views. Joining the European Union, the then common market, meant that we betrayed New Zealand farmers or Caribbean banana growers. It was a disgraceful decision taken by Ted Heath at the time. And what we need are true free trade deals that our parliament can negotiate with whichever countries in the world we wish to partner. The eighth reason, I shudder to mention this, immigration. Now, I'm a libertarian. I'm the son of an immigrant, and I'm married to an immigrant. I firmly believe that immigration strengthens nations, enriches our culture, and I welcome the contribution in this country of immigrants. Invariably, most people migrate to another country, this one included, to better themselves, and they exhibit enormous drive, self-sacrifice, and entrepreneurial acumen to come here. But we cannot avoid the fact that there are some people who migrate to this country to sponge off our welfare state. Something made all the easier thanks to our membership of the European Union. The day that we leave the European Union, we will be better off out because we will regain control of our borders. We will be able to choose who it is that we welcome into this country and who it is that we don't welcome in. Now, our friends on the pro-European side will tell us that things aren't that bad, really. They'll, they'll blush bashfully and say, you know, you're just banging on about this issue. Well, as Norman Tebbit, who we'll be enjoying tomorrow, um, who said that if it looks like a duck, 
waddles like a duck and quacks like, like a, a duck, duck. chances are it's a duck. <laughs> if it's got a parliament, an anthem, a flag, passports, a supreme court, and citizens, it's a nation, and that's what the Eurocrats have wanted from day one. We were lied to in the 1970s, and we've been lied to consistently ever since. Last week, I turned 40. I was one year old when the referendum took place. I want a referendum. I want a chance to have a say on the future of my country's relations with 26 other states within the European Union. So, I'm a lawyer, I come up with lists. I train activists, I come up with lists. I think there are 10 lessons for us in the Better Off Out campaign, if I may be so bold. The first is to encourage everyone in this room to be proactive. We need to get up earlier than our opponents. We need to work harder than our opponents. We only have one shot to get this right. If we lose, we will not get another chance. If we win, oh, I guarantee you they will have another vote and another vote and another vote <laughs> until the right result comes through. But we cannot afford to lose this vote when it comes. Secondly, Rory touched on it, we must be positive in our message. We must speak about what we're for, not just what we're against. We have an absolutely compelling positive message to sell of what Britain will be like as a true, free, independent, sovereign state again. We shouldn't have to campaign on the politics of fear. Let's leave that to the pro-Europeans. They've got nothing else to say apart from to scare us about losing jobs and making up figures as to how many jobs we will lose. So as well as being positive, my third point is that we should be optimistic. We should speak about what life will be like once we've left the European Union and how it truly will be better for all of us. There will be more jobs. There will be an opportunity for people to become wealthier and for people to develop relationships around the world. It is a positive, optimistic message that we have and we shouldn't be shy about spelling it out in that way. Our fourth point is relevance. All of us here, I expect, have the capacity to become Eurobores, to talk about sovereignty, subsidiarity, direct effect, and all these wonderful arcane European terms. I've done it myself, even in this speech, by talking about the acquis communautaire. But we need to speak about the direct impact of the European Union on ordinary voters' lives. Not about sovereignty, not about grand themes that they won't understand or they won't have time to care about. So let's focus on things like the cost of a common agricultural policy or the effect that the common fisheries policy has had on our fishing communities and how by leaving the European Union we can reclaim our fishing rights up to 200 miles from our shores in the North Sea which would give us two thirds of the North Sea to fish. We need to be all embracing. Learn from the success that Matthew Elliott showed in the No to AV campaign. Oh, we oh, need proper yeah. cross-party alliances that we build that involve people who aren't even really interested in politics. So it's right that we honour the memory of Tony Benn this evening. My God, what a great Eurosceptic leader uh, he was. And it is critical that we find a way to work with people uh, on the left who do not necessarily share our views on a whole host of other issues. And maybe find one or two Liberal Democrats uh, who might also have similar views. I only said one or two, I don't want to get too carried away. Um, my sixth point here, presentation. Okay, we need to be very close, uh, very careful about our use of language. Guarantee you that The Guardian, the BBC and their fellow travellers will do anything they can to paint us as swivel-eyed extremists. You've seen them doing that to uh, people both in UKIP and the Conservative Party. We have got to choose our spokesmen and our imagery with absolute care and most importantly show iron discipline in the way that the campaign is run. Okay, there should be no opportunities for people to go off on a tangent and a flight of fancy of their own. We need to win this campaign. Seventh, be informed. Ruth mentioned it when she was talking. We need to know the arguments. We need to be absolutely 100% sure of our facts when we debate people, because again, the BBC and The Guardian will use any opportunity they've got 
to try and show us as being ignorant, whereas they, of course, have all the answers so that they can govern us uh, in future years. Eight, we need to capture the zeitgeist. Okay? We need to be the side of the campaign that is fun. We need to use humour. We need to use the social media effectively. We need to create an air of inevitability that we are going to win this campaign and that ours is the forward-looking side of the campaign without being complacent, because this is going to be a bloody difficult campaign to win, but we need to be the ones who actually have that sense of fun, bonhomie and optimism in it. Allied to that, number nine, is we need to be like swans. The other side will campaign filthily, in the gutter. We must not respond in kind, overtly. <laughs> so above the surface, we have to be serene. Underneath, kick furiously. But we need to be the ones who show that everything we're doing is forward-looking and optimistic. They've got nothing positive to say. And finally, we need to fight like our way of life and our nation depends on it, because it truly does. As Enoch Powell said, independence, the freedom of a self-governing nation, is in my estimation the highest political good, for which any disadvantage, if need be, and any sacrifice are a cheap price. We can win this campaign. We will win this campaign, but we must win this campaign. Thank you very much indeed.